I'm Whitney Tilson. I hope you enjoy this video. If you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, just email me at info at caselearning.com. Good afternoon, everyone. Why don't we get started? Uh, I'm Whitney Tilson. My uh, partner, Glenn Tung, is, um, uh, is joined me as well. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off at our live session a week ago, uh, where uh, on understanding financial statements and do more of a dive now that we sort of have covered uh, last week what's on the financial statements and the, the three main financial statements, what the line items are. Uh, spend today uh, looking at another company, uh, Costco, in addition to Apple, and uh, start doing some analysis. So uh, I'm going to uh, flip my video off screen and um, put up the slide presentation. Um, and uh, would like to start just with a brief overview of uh, case learning and what Glenn and I are doing here. Just a couple slides and uh, then Whitney, we'll dive Whitney, into the analysis. So, Whitney, sorry for interrupting. Um, Whitney, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, can you also, I'm just saying, can you also go through the uh, logistics of the webinar, um, just how to uh, raise their hand, et cetera? Yes. Uh, thanks, Glenn, for reminding me. Um, so. Um, via webinar, uh, Glenn and I are the hosts and panelists, so you'll be able to see our video at all times to the extent we have it turned on. Uh, Glenn, I flipped off your video, so you might want to flip it back on. Um, and, uh, and then everyone else is an attendee, and uh, there are two ways you can participate. Um, we've got outline open, and make sure that when you post, uh, you can either uh, type something in the chat field, um, and, and uh, there's a pull-down menu for panelists, and then there's a pull-down menu for panelists and attendees. Um, the default, uh, I think, is panelists only, but I encourage you to say panelists and attendees so that the other attendees can see what you're uh, posting, the questions that you're asking. Uh, but when I'm talking, Glenn will be monitoring that <clears throat> and vice versa. So uh, the other uh, option is to raise hand. Uh, we've got about 18 people right now. Um, we're going to uh, hopefully have plenty of Q&A and encourage that. Uh, so, so you can raise your hand and we can turn your audio. And if you have it, video live, uh, we can promote you, to, promote you to panelists is the term that Zoom uses. Um, uh, and then people uh, can see you uh, as you speak and answer your question. But um, I, either way, uh, if you don't have video, uh, we can just turn your audio on or you can just ask questions on the chat. So. Uh, those, those are the options. So, um, so just a quick overview of case learning. I was in the hedge fund business for uh, almost 20 years. Eight of them, uh, Glenn and I, uh, were working together as co-managers. Um, I closed up the business uh, la uh, almost exactly a year ago after a period of sustained underperformance trailing this long bull market, uh, which is very frustrating. Uh, and uh, realized that, uh, that there was both a, an opportunity out there uh, that, that really no one was teaching what I call lessons from the trenches um, of what it's really like uh, out there investing, trying to beat the market, running a business, et cetera, that I'd done, uh, and both Glenn and I had done a lot of teaching and mentoring over the years. So uh, uh, after uh, reflecting for a little while and initially pulling together a group of uh, a dozen students uh, last December, uh, we launched uh, Case Learning and are having a lot of fun uh, teaching everything we learned and observed over uh, nearly uh, two decades in the hedge fund industry and uh, combined between Glenn and me, uh, more than 50 years of experience in the financial industry. Our goal is to help our students uh, learn from our successes, stand on our shoulders and achieve even greater success uh, and equally importantly, though, learn from our mistakes uh, and the things that, uh, uh, that cost us and eventually forced me to close the business. Um, getting ahead in life is not just a function of doing smart things on the way up, but uh, it's equally important to uh, avoid the things that can undo you. So uh, we offer a three-day Lessons from the Trenches Investing Boot Camp, a one-day seminar on how to launch and build an investment fund, and a one-day seminar, uh, an advanced seminar on short selling. Uh, uh, we do this periodically every month or two. Um, we're in fact doing all three of these programs next week in New York City, Monday through Friday. Uh, we've got a few slots. If you're interested, uh, contact me. Um, and we also teach these via webinar, like what we're doing right now using this exact technology. And for each day of the boot camp and for each one day seminar, we break it into three two and a half hour sessions teach it uh, from 7 to 9 30 every morning so people uh, in Asia for example can do it after work 
Um, people in Europe can do it middle of the day. Um, and here in the United States, uh, people can do it uh, before work or those on the West Coast really before work. Um, but the webinar technology uh, works great, very interactive. Um, and uh, so it's great to be able to reach a global audience and people don't have to travel to New York, et cetera, to, to take our programs. Uh, so uh, we're just finishing up a, a six days of the two seminars that we've been teaching via webinar. Tomorrow's the last of six days. We're gonna be doing the webinars, all three um, programs, 15 days of webinars starting on Monday, October 29th. And as I mentioned, we're doing the three in-person programs here in New York City next week. Uh, we also have a conference on short selling, our second one coming up on December 3rd, where we invite uh, the world's best short sellers to come and pitch their favorite short ideas. The only conference in the world focused uh, exclusively on short ideas. Um, and we think it's a pretty interesting time. Take a look at Tilray. Uh, to be looking at short ideas. Uh, so again, contact me. Um, I can uh, send you out uh, uh, a, a discount um, in addition to the early bird rate we have going on right now. So that's a quick overview of what we're doing. So let's talk about the agenda for today. Um, last week, uh, we did an overview of the three financial statements. And believe it or not, that took the full two hours that we'd scheduled. Uh, so this afternoon, we're going to be looking, uh, doing, taking another look at the three financial statements, but now that we know what's on them, uh, looking at how to analyze it um, and do sort of an exercise. So uh, generally for each one, uh, I will uh, go through some basic analyses using Apple as an example, and then ask you to uh, do the same calculations for Costco. So we'll pause a little bit in the webinar. Um, I've emailed out the financial statements for both companies to everyone um, and uh, let you guys do some, uh, you know, take a minute or two to do some pretty straightforward and simple calculations. Uh, the calculator on your phone will probably be sufficient. Um, and, uh, and then we've got uh, some additional um, uh, analyses and in particular calculating valuation metrics uh, that we'll go through near the end. Um, again, we encourage you to ask questions, uh, just raise your hand or uh, type something up on the chat line. So uh, let's start with the first uh, fin uh, financial statement, the income statement. And uh, generally speaking, you're doing two types of analyses. One, calculating items on the income statement, um, comparing, uh, looking at uh, uh, one, one time period, for example, and calculating margins. Then you're comparing one time period to another time period and looking at growth rates. Um, and then lastly, you uh, want to compare one company with other similar companies to, to see how these uh, uh, metrics uh, compare. Um, generally, keep in mind that these are indicators. They're not absolutes. So um, even companies in the same sector, retailers, for example, will have enormously different uh, profit margins, growth rates, uh, uh, et cetera, depending on, uh, on what type of business it is, what's happening in their sector, et cetera. So these are very preliminary, very simple analyses that are meant to um, you know, start the analytical process. So margins, um, we're, we're going to uh, walk through some exact calculations, but um, two of the primary margins uh, that most people will look at are gross margin and net margin. Another one is operating margin, uh, which we can get to in a little bit. But um, uh, gross margin is simply the revenues. Uh, minus your cost of goods sold, your direct cost of providing the product or service to your customers. And you subtract that out and that's your gross, uh, your gross income. Gross income divided by revenues tells you your gross margin. Um, and the idea here is, is it's how much of a markup is a company taking? So, um, you know, a company like Microsoft or a software company that has very low direct costs uh, to deliver the product might have an 80% gross margin. Uh, a company like Costco might have a, uh, you know, has something like a 12% gross margin. Uh, in other words, what Costco is doing is, is they're buying, you know, a big box of cereal from General Mills, two or three boxes of Cheerios strapped together, sold as one packet. Um, they buy it for from General Mills for uh, 10 bucks, let's say, and they turn around and they sell it to you for only $11, a very small markup. Uh, you know, on the other hand, a pharmaceutical company is producing a pill for a dollar and they're turning around and selling it for ten dollars um, um, to give you an example of the, the types of markups. So that's what gross gross margin, excuse me, is measuring. Um, 
operating margin, then subtracts out uh, all the overhead and operating costs. Um, and that's the operating profit of the business prior to taxes and interest income, financing uh, elements. Um, operating margin is simply your operating income divided by revenues. And then at the bottom, you have your, your net income, your profit or earnings. Um, the net margin is simply your uh, profit or net income divided by revenues. Um, and this shows you, this is probably the most important metric. How profitable is a company? Uh, at the end of the day, for every dollar of sales, um, how much profit is left over at the end of the day after you subtract out all the expenses? And again, uh, very healthy companies uh, have profit margins ranging anywhere from you know 1% uh, to 50% um, uh, after taxes. So um, then uh, let's just turn to another piece of the analysis, which would be growth rates. Um, and this is something investors really care about. Is a company growing? If so, how rapidly, how sustainable? What does that growth rate look uh, over time? Uh, so calculating growth rates is pretty straightforward. You simply divide the current period by the prior period um, and, uh, and, and subtract one um, and convert it to percentages. So if a company's revenues grow from $10 to $12, obviously you don't even need to calculate it. That's 20% growth. But what's the calculation behind it? It's 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. Drop the one, minus one is 0.2 and move the decimal place, that's 20% growth. So that's the math behind it. Just keep that math in mind uh, as we do the exercises. So um, here's what I'd like uh, to put out there. Uh, ask, uh, ask you to calculate uh, four um, numbers, two margins and two growth rates. Um, the margins uh, for the current period for Apple and Costco, um, so there are eight total numbers here. Uh, for Apple and Costco, calculate uh, the gross uh, gross margin, and in the case of Costco, you're, um, they don't provide you with gross income. You're you're going to have to subtract merchandise costs from revenue first to calculate gross profit, and then divide by the revenues. Apple does that for you, and it shows you what the, the that gross profit is. So all you do have to do is divide by revenues, but Costco does not provide it for you um, in its in income statement. Um, then calculate the net margin for both companies and then calculate the year over year revenue growth and the year over year net income growth. So let's uh, let me put up there's Apple, um, the income statement and there's Costco, the next page, uh, the income statement. So let me um, I'm going to leave these up on the screen and I'm going to take um, why don't we take uh, two minutes uh, starting now and uh, uh, and give you the chance uh, to look at these numbers, um, pull out your trusted calculator, and in the case of Apple, um, simply use, uh, let me highlight it here, um, use, uh, use the most recent period here. Uh, so um, there's, your, there's your sales up top. Um, use, this, use this quarter to calculate your uh, gross and net margins uh, in just in the most recent quarter. And then for the growth rate, compare uh, the same quarter last year. Uh, hey, hey Whit Whitney, Whitney. Yes. I've just been calculating here. I've been using the six months. Can you? Do you mind just pointing them to the six month numbers? Oh, okay. Um, all it's, right. Uh, you know what, Glenn? While we while we do the two minutes, let's just stick to the quarterly. I think we'll get confused with the six months. So. Um, okay. So, okay. So we've got two minutes here, um, and I'll whip out my calculator as well. And um, uh, let's calculate these uh, numbers for the, just for the most recent quarter. So two minutes uh, starting right now. All right, Glenn, that was two minutes. Um, do you want to um, uh, start walking through? We'll do these numbers for Apple here and, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of type them on the screen as you uh, through them and uh, turn on your video. If you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Um, okay, so for Apple, um, what are you starting with here, Whitney? The uh, balance sheet or the cat or the uh, income statement ratios? Um, let's just start with uh, the four metrics um, here. So for the income statement. Um, we're looking for uh, gross margin uh, and net, uh, net margin and then year-over-year revenue growth and net income growth. 
Right. So um, let's see. For a for a gross margin, um, as we as we talked about earlier, you're looking at the gross dollars, which is twenty three four 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 forty two. Um, that's the third number down in um, March 2018, um, and that as a percentage of uh, total sales, which is 61.137. And uh, my calculator just glitched on me, so give me one sec. So don't worry, um, I've got it on the screen here, Glenn. If you just check it out here, so 23.442 divided by 61.137. That's billion. So 23 billion minus 60 uh, divided by 61 billion is 0.383 or 38.3 percent gross margins so what that means is apple is two-thirds of apple's revenues is iphones um you know most of the rest of it is devices uh computers ipads etc but iphone is the biggie um so what that means is is that apple's direct costs um, is is uh, uh, sixty two percent roughly of everything they sell. So if they sell you an iPhone X or an iPhone ten for a thousand dollars, six hundred and twenty bucks of that they pay to Foxconn and the manuf the, the manufacturer of the phone, and Apple keeps thirty eight point three percent as gross profit. Now they still have a lot of other expenses um, as well. You can see down here uh, research and development SGNA. Um, are other expenses, um, but those fall below the gross margin line. Those are not the direct costs associated with selling the product. Now, keep in mind that Apple is also a service business. So, for example, in the revenue line would be um, if you uh, have a, uh, a contract for service that enables you to go in uh, to make phone calls uh, or to go into the Genius Bar and uh, get support. Well, there the revenues, the gross, uh, the, the cost of goods sold there is the labor to provide that service. So if Apple sells you a $100 uh, service contract and they have to pay their employees and other costs of running their phone centers, et cetera, to provide you with that service of say $70, then they would have, that would be in the cost of, uh, of sales number. You'd have $30 left over um, in gross profit. It's interesting, uh, Apple notice here calls it gross margin but in fact, it should be labeled gross profit. The gross margin is the percentage of dividing the gross profit by uh, the revenues. Uh, so uh, Glenn, you wanna um, run through the numbers on uh, net margin? Okay, so on net margin, um, in the, uh, and, and this is the, the net income margin, um, the Apple generated $13.822 billion on their revenues of $61 billion. So their um, uh, net income margin is simply the net income divided by revenues, 13.822 divided by 61.137, and that's 22.6%, which is a very, very high um, net income margin. Great. Um, you wanna move through, uh, Glenn, I'm actually putting up the numbers on the screen here uh, as you're going through so people can see it, but uh, just go through um, the, the growth rate, top line and bottom line growth rate. Yep, so the growth rate would be simply, uh, what did they do a year ago versus what did they do today? So um, today they did $61.137 um, billion, and a year ago they did um, $52,896. So if you divide $52,896 um, into 61, you get 15.6% growth rate. Yeah, so that's the number right there. Um, everyone see the calculation, just current period divided by the prior period. Uh, 1.156, drop the one, move the decimal place, 15.6% growth rate. Pretty simple, right? And then um, um, and the and, last uh, number, Glenn? And then for net income margin, uh, for net income growth rate, it's pretty much the same math. It's current period divided by the prior period. And if you divide, uh, if, you, if you do that division, it's um, 20, it's approximately 25% year over year growth. Yep, 25.3%. So. Um, here we've just done some super simple calculations, takes, takes no time at all. Um, but what is this telling us um, as you just sort of step back from this is it's telling you that, that Apple is a highly profitable company. One, I mean, just looking at this, these numbers are enormous. In one quarter, Apple did $61 billion in sales. So this is uh, one of the largest companies in the world. Not surprising, it's the most valuable company in the world. Uh, by market capitalization, which we'll talk about later. But um, gar it's a gargantuan company. We see that looking at the numbers, um, producing astounding profits. I mean, 
Um, you know, the fact they're producing $13.8 billion of earned net income, the bottom line, this number, this number down here, um, uh, is, 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 so it's astoundingly profitable, number one. Uh, number two is, is you can see that it's still, um, hold on just a second, let me, uh, let me highlight, oh, well, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I accidentally, uh, the text blue, um, and let's see if, uh, I'm not sure how to, how to change that color. Let me see here, is that going to work? No. Uh, well, all right, so bear with me just a second. So, um, so secondly, um, you can see it's, it, it's got very high margins. Uh, so they're marking up uh, the product a lot that they're selling um, and uh, making 22.6% uh, uh, profit margin is one of the highest you'll ever see among major uh, corporations. Um, and then it's also still growing. It's growing its top line, i.e. its revenues or sales. All those things mean the same thing at a 15.6% rate. Uh, but its expenses are not growing as rapidly. Um, uh, so therefore the bottom line, the profits are growing even faster um, at a 25% rate. So enormous company with very fat margins growing at a very healthy rate. Um, it's, this is an extraordinary company. So um, let me, um, let's uh, move on and uh, look at Costco here. Um, so um, let's, uh, let me pull up a text box right here and I'll start running through the numbers on Costco. Um, but Glenn, do you wanna, do you wanna, um, uh, do you wanna talk through it? Um, sure, sure, uh, well, well Co Costco, um, sure. Um, Costco's um, uh, a tad easier. Um, because we don't have the quarterly, we just have the year-over-year -year growth. So first let's look at um, the, uh, um, uh, the gross margin. Um, so the gross profit would be, um, as Whitney said, you need to calculate what the, um, uh, the, the gross profit is before you get a percentage. And gross profit would be total revenues minus merchandise costs. So uh, total revenues is $129 billion and uh, 129.025. And merchandise costs are $111 uh, billion, uh, $882 million. So if you subtract those two numbers, you get a, um, a gross margin, uh, gross profit of um, 17,143. Okay. Um, so uh, here, let me highlight these numbers, Glenn. Uh, let me pull up the right drawing tool here. So um, to calculate uh, gross, uh, the gross margin, you, um, hold on, I've got the wrong color here. <laughs> uh, let's see if this works a little better, good. So uh, you got 129 billion of revenues minus 100 and almost 112 billion of merchandise costs. Now remember, a Apple then subtracted those two numbers and gave you the net. Here you have to calculate it. So it's uh, approximately 17 billion of, uh, of gross profit. Um, and then you divide the 17 billion by 129 billion. And uh, what's, that, what's that number, Glenn? 13.2%. Okay, so um, that's, so Costco has a 13.2% uh, gross margin. Compare that to Apple's uh, 30, what was it? 32% gross margin. So you can see that Costco is, uh, is a much lower margin business um, uh, that basically means they're only marking up what they're selling a little bit above their costs. Um, it's one of the lowest gross margins you'll ever see in fact. Um, so uh, Glenn, you wanna run through the math on the net, net, uh, net margin? Sure, well the, the net margin is simply the, 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 um, the net income to 2.679 billion dollars divided by total revenues of 129 uh, billion. And so that's a little over 2%, that's 2.07% um, net income margin compared to Apple's 22%. Yeah, so uh, again, Costco is a business that's a uh, high volume at low margin. Uh, people shop at Costco because it's got great prices um, and it has great prices because it sources at a low price and only has a, a very small markup. Um, and uh, customers know they're getting a great deal, uh, which is why they pay 55 bucks a year uh, to be a member of Costco for the right to shop there. Um, but a uh, very different business model than Apple for sure. Uh, 
um, uh, they're both great businesses, by the way, but Apple is, you know, one of the greatest businesses of all time. Costco uh, is, is there's a lot less room for error here with Costco, um, uh, you know, with, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of its margins. Um, let's just uh, look at growth rate, uh, Glenn. You want to uh, just run through the math on the year over year um, top line and bottom line growth? So the, uh, the top line is this year's uh, uh, revenues divided by last year's revenues. We did that um, a couple times before. So let me just tell you when you do it, the answer is 8.7%. Uh, so they okay. so that's just 129.025 uh, divided by 118719, uh, 1.08 or whatever. Uh, that's just an 8% growth rate. Yeah, it's, it's closer to 9, 8.7%. Okay. And then the bottom line. Um, what's the net income more, uh, the net income growth rate, it's 2.679 uh, uh, billion divided by 2.350 billion, and that's approximately 14%. Okay, so um, again, uh, this is, by the way, what you like to see a company that is growing its profits faster than it's growing its, its revenues, means that it's controlling costs well. There are some economies of scale and efficiencies as it's growing. Uh, and this is a very nice, healthy growth rate, uh, 8%, eight, almost 9% top, top line growth, 14% bottom line growth. Uh, but it's no Apple, uh, you know, which is growing uh, much faster uh, than this, almost, uh, almost uh, double, roughly double these rates. Um, so, by the way, can you look at this and say, okay, uh, you know, Apple is a better business than Costco? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, there, it probably is. Uh, but uh, one of the disadvantages Apple has is, is that it's, it's a technology company. Um, it every year has to come out with a hit new product, more sales, because um, two thirds of their revenues come from selling one product, the iPhone. And the history of the technology industry is littered with the carcasses of device makers who had a hot product. Think the Blackberry, think the Palm Pilot. Um, now, I, I, I think the iPhone is, is uh, much more dominant and has a much, uh, much better ecosystem, uh, et cetera. So I, I'm not predicting uh, that that's going to happen to Apple. But, uh, you know, the one thing to keep in mind as you're, as you're analyzing uh, the financial statements and comparing different companies, um, you know, one company may have absolutely mouthwatering economic characteristics, uh, but it may be a risky business model. It may be a, a fad kind of company. Um, we often teach Abercrombie and Fitch and compare it to Costco. And for a time there, Abercrombie and Fitch had incredible numbers, incredible growth rates, incredible profit margins. Uh, but it was in a, a fashion and fad business. Um, and it's fallen on hard times and may well go bankrupt, whereas Costco just continues chugging away. Uh, it's, uh, so Costco's business may not be nearly as high growth. It's obviously super low margin. On the other hand, uh, Costco's business is much more predictable than you know any technology business, any kind of fashion business, et cetera. So, um, Whitney, so Whitney, we got an absolutely terrific and insightful question from the group, which is, um, could you talk about the role of membership fees and its contribution to gross margin almost 50%? If you take a look yes, at gross um, at membership fees, membership fees are almost 100% uh, profit item. And if you look at them and compare them to the net income of Costco, you see something pretty interesting. Net income almost exactly matches membership fees. And if you go back in time, that's been true uh, since Costco's inception. And in fact, one way to think about Costco's business model is everything they do in selling um, uh, household items, et cetera, et cetera, everything they do, they do at break even so that they can earn those 100% profit membership fees. Um, it, it, it was the way that I used to model Costco when looking at it from a valuation perspective. It's a, it's a lot easier to say that, uh, well, they're just going to um, uh, grow membership uh, numbers of members uh, at the following rate and, you know, the pricing at the uh, at an additional rate. And if everything else happens at break even, which effectively merchandise costs, SG&A, um, those are all related to the goods that they're selling, um, you get the membership fees. So that's that's a, that's a great question. If you look at the gross margin before membership fees, which would be the net sales minus merchandise costs, the gross margins are even less than the 13.2 that we uh, calculated. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, good points, Glenn. So keep in mind, Costco is unlike almost any other retailer other than maybe Sam's Club and BJ's Wholesale, which is it's a membership club and you have to pay an upfront fee in order to go shopping there. Think about that. There's no other retailer that, that you know checks your ID before you come in the door and won't let you in unless you paid in advance uh, some sort of membership fee. But Costco's value proposition, which it pioneered, is that you pay us the membership fee be up front and that's the profit we're going to make all year and everything else we do is is we're now on your side of the table and we're out there trying to find you the best products at the lowest price and we only mark them up a tiny bit just to cover the cost of operating this bare bones warehouse um, and we're not tr trying to make a profit on the Cheerios that we sell you um, and the million other things we sell you all we're doing is just trying to make a profit on the membership fees and that's effectively when you compare the numbers here that's effectively what they're doing um, it's uh, you know if you think about most retailing is uh, there's tension there's conflict like the retailer is trying to snooker you into overpaying for certain things and so they put high priced high margin items uh, you know spontaneous purchases right up near the cash register and they put the discount sale items in the back of the store, forcing you to walk to the back of the store in the hopes that you'll buy some regularly priced stuff, you know, on your way there or back. They sell the end caps to the aisles, to the merchants uh, and, and, the, um, and the vendors um, in, in exchange uh, for taking cash for placement on their shelf, uh, not, which is not necessarily the products that are the best bargain for you, the customer. Costco has a different business model um, and it's proven to be highly successful, which is we're on your side of the table. Just pay us a flat fee up front and you can shop here as much as you want. And if we get a great deal on a, sh uh, on a, on a ship full of jeans, let's say, and we can get you some great, nice branded jeans, let's say, at a great price, um, we're not gonna try and take advantage of that and charge a big markup, even though we might be able to get away with it. We're only gonna charge our, our little small markup, no matter what. Um, and uh, you know, they're famous stories of the CEO of uh, Costco, Jim Senegal, um, who walks around the store, uh, walks around stores, and he asks, for example, the person who runs the produce department. And the person who runs the produce department says, for, says good news, um, because we moved the fruits and vegetables so quickly this week, we had less spoilage and, and we had allocated, let's say, a 5% uh, cost for um, the uh, stuff going bad. But because we were so efficient and we sold it so quickly, only 2% went bad, and therefore we made an extra three points of profit this week. And instead of congratulating the head of the produce section, Jim Senegal criticized him and said, said, what are you doing? If you save any money, you need to pass that immediately along to the customers. Um, they've already paid us up front. Um, and we're now passing along all savings to them. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting, it's pretty powerful, um, and, uh, and you can sort of see it in the numbers here. So, so just to summarize here before we move on to the balance sheet, all we've shown you is, is the most basic calculations, uh, but even very simple analysis here can tell you some important things about a company um, in terms of how it operates its business, um, and whether this is, uh, what, what stage it's in. Is this a high growth business? Is this a, a solid steady grower? Um, and if you look at this data over five or 10 years, you can start to get a sense of, of is it a cyclical business? Um, um, and if you go back to 2008, for example, look how the business performed in the last recession. Um, that can give you some real clues. Um, other analyses you might do here, is you might look at the share count down here and calculate is the share count going up or down? Is the company diluting its shareholders or is it buying back stock? Uh, you might wanna do a calculation here to see what kind of income tax rate they're paying and, uh, and see you know, how clever are they in avoiding taxes? Uh, I'll give you a hint, Apple is very clever in avoiding taxes. Costco, you know, there's, there's, they don't have offshore entities in Ireland that they can stash their profits in and uh, pay some bogus low tax rate. Another thing you might want to do is not just calculate um, your merchandise costs, which is uh, as a percentage of sales, which is what the gross margin tells you, but look at your other costs like SG&A costs and see, uh, calculate that percentage and then compare it to previous years. And um, first you have to com uh, convert to a percentage uh, before you can start comparing and seeing what those trends are over time. So 
there's loads more analysis to do here, uh, but but this is um, uh, you know sort of the basics. So let's move on to some basic analysis of the balance sheet. So the balance sheet, keep in mind, is a snapshot at one period of time. It's used to calculate, uh, it, you're generally looking at a company's financial strength. Can they generate a healthy return on capital, manage their assets well? Can they meet their short-term and long-term obligations? So let's look at a couple quick calculations um, that are tests of liquidity. Can a company meet its, its obligations, um, its short-term obligations? So. Um, the current ratio, there are two ratios you look at, the current ratio and the quick ratio. And the current ratio is pretty straightforward. It's current assets divided by current liabilities. Um, and here are the numbers for Apple over its uh, last full year. Um, and uh, you can see that the current ratio uh, was 1.35. In other words, current assets exceed current liabilities by 35%. Um, in 2016, and that dropped an uh, insignificant amount to 28% above uh, in 2017. Um, you know, as this number starts to go towards zero, uh, not zero, excuse me, it goes toward one, where there's very, there, where there aren't very much many current assets above current liabilities. Um, so you want to, uh, that's a worrisome sign. And also you, you want to look at the trends. So the quick ratio is a more stringent test and basically it takes out inventories because inventories uh, are not easily convertible to cash uh, with most businesses. So instead it's looking at just cash and short-term investments and accounts receivable. Um, so only a portion of your current uh, assets divided by your current liabilities. And so this number is always by definition going to be lower uh, than your current ratio. And it's just a more stringent test, again, that you would apply, particularly if you're worried about a company being able to meet its obligations. Um, ideally, you'd like to see a number above one. Uh, ideally, you'd like to see a steady trend, uh, not a declining trend. Um, in the case of Apple, App Apple obviously is not gonna have any problem paying its bills, but here's the calculation for Apple. Uh, Manoj, I see um, you asked the question on the chat line. Um, uh, and you still have your hand up. I'm not sure if that's because you have an addition, if you have a question um, or whether you have it up from before. I see just- his, uh, his additional question, Whitney, had to do with um, how the Costco model compares to the Amazon Prime model. Yeah, do you want to uh, take a and first then, shot at that? And then in addition to that, uh, there's another question, that how will the Costco model work with increased online and they seem to be lagging in that space? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I think we, should, we can uh, answer it uh, on a team basis. Um, Amazon Prime is a similar um, type of concept where you pay, I don't even know what I pay Amazon Prime anymore, and you get a whole slew of features. Um, and you pay they just increase the basis. price? I forget how much. Um, someone, uh, $109, they just increased it to. So it's free two-day shipping and uh, Amazon um, movies and music and um, a whole bunch of other stuff. And so it, it's, it's similar in that it locks customers into using your service because the perceived value every time you shop um, is constantly reinforcing that you're getting a good deal, whereas the once per year payment, um, you, you, you don't tend to amortize that in your head against everything that you're, uh, um, that you're purchasing. So um, it's, Amazon has many, many more um, things that they can offer. And Amazon has a unique place in the world. They're not uh, tethered um, by conventional profitability uh, uh, desires by, by investors. They, uh, they basically manage a business to, um, to not make a lot of money and to re reinvest everything that they do uh, into growth into new initiatives, um, that implies that you have a cost of capital of effectively zero. And when you have a cost of capital of effectively zero, um, it, it it makes things it makes it life easier um, uh, to compete. So they have um, they have a cost of capital advantage that no one else in the business has, uh, and no retailer, Brooks and Mortar, online or otherwise. Um, so that's that's pretty unique about the position in the world that they've. Um, uh, that they've ascended to. Um, but I would say that the membership fee and Amazon Prime have 
have similar dynamics. Uh, at Costco, there are other things you get yeah. with Prime, not just the opportunity to shop in store, but uh, you, you can buy their cheap gasoline and you can go on vacations and buy cars and things like that. Right. Notice a huge difference though is, is Amazon Prime, you can shop at Amazon all day long um, and you don't have to be a member of Amazon Prime. This is an optional upgrade that gives you free two day delivery um, and a whole bunch of other things, access to their, their video streaming service that competes with Netflix, their music service, et cetera. Um, but, but it's optional. It's, an, it's brilliantly clever of Amazon to do this because as Glenn points out, you know, once you're in 109 bucks and you're getting free two day shipping, um, that you know, people just instinctively now just go to Amazon and do all their shopping there. And that's why Amazon, you know, one of the reasons Amazon accounts for something like 50% of all online retail is through Amazon. Um, it's genius, but it's different from Costco. In the Costco, you must pay to become a member uh, before you can shop, you know, the first time there. Um, so very you smart. Um, if Yaroslav asks, will the Costco model work with an increase in online? They seem to be lagging in that space. That's been the big question for Costco is they haven't, uh, they're still not doing very much online or, or delivery. Um, and so, you know, is Costco going to get Amazon? Um, and uh, so far the evidence seems to be no, Costco is holding up awfully well, continuing to grow very nicely. Same store comps are, are great. Um, but, you know, that's a, that's a big question mark. Um, you know, it's, it's not that Costco's there's not Costco's, you know, 10 years from now or 20 years from now, somehow going to be driven out of business like so many other retailers. There's always going to be a place for them. Uh, but the question is, is, is um, are they going to be able to continue to grow like they have in the past? Um, or will Amazon really impair their growth rate? Again, doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that that that's happening now. I can tell you as an intensely loyal customer for more than 20 years of Amazon and, uh, probably more than 20 or 30 years of Costco. Um, those are basically, those two places account for a wildly disproportionate share of my spending. But um, the, the, I would say my Costco spending hasn't gone down even as um, you know, I, I shop more and more um, on Amazon. Um, there's still an element of um, being able to see the product, to touch it, um, to pick it out myself. Um, lots of uh, fresh goods and produce and so forth. Um, and there's also a treasure hunt element of going to Costco where they've always got new products and, um, you know, uh, a new shipment of great jeans or shirts or something that uh, I just never would have seen, but they, and it's only there for that week. It's not going to be there two weeks later when I come back. Um, so I, I would, um, I suspect I'm, uh, I'm fairly typical of Costco's customers, actually. Anything you want to add, Glenn, before we move on? Great question. No, I think the um, the average Costco customer um, is a Prime member as well. I would I would I would imagine that. Yeah, keep in mind Costco uh, tilts to a fairly high end demographic. Um, even though it's super low prices, you'd think a lot of low income people would shop there, but in fact, you know Costco's uh, average customer is probably twice the household income as Walmart, for example. Uh, um, uh, so, so yeah, I would bet almost all customers are Amazon Prime customers as well. So um, let's um, continue running through here. Um, uh, another uh, calculation, the balance sheet. So you have the current ratio, the quick ratio, um, the debt to equity ratio. Um, and this is just a measure of how, how levered a company is. Because um, keep in mind, the equity is is assets minus liabilities equal equity. So a lot of equity means your assets vastly exceed your liabilities. It's a measure of financial strength. Um, if a company uh, has a lot of debt um, and not a ton of assets offsetting it, um, the debt to equity ratios um, gonna be, there There uh, could be a lot more debt than equity on a company's balance sheet. And that just means it's, it's riskier. So um, let's calculate the debt to equity ratio for Apple now. The number here is a little absurd because um, Apple does have a lot of debt, uh, but it also has mountains of cash. So um, normally the calculation here would be something like net debt to equity, but since Apple has a net cash position, the number here would there there the number here wouldn't make any sense um, because the company has no net debt. So just so we can do the calculations, uh, we're just going to take the straight debt, not adjusting for cash, just to show what the calculation looks like. So um, in this case, uh, Apple has less debt than equity. So it's a number less than 1.68. 
Uh, Apple's actually been borrowing a lot of money to buy back a ton of stock because most of their cash is trapped offshore. So their debt uh, went up a lot last year, even though it was a massively profitable company. Um, they uh, they bought back, um, they, they, they borrowed even more than that. We saw this on the cash flow statement, which we'll see in a few more pages. Um, so Whitney, so the, Whitney I, I just want to pause here for a second. Um, the, the equity account of $134 billion um, is it's dramatically misstating the financial condition um, of Apple. Um, they have about 5 billion shares outstanding uh, today, and um, they had about 7 billion shares outstanding maybe, let's call it, five years ago. So they have bought in 2 billion shares, and with the stock price of uh, in excess of $200 per share now, that represents $400 billion of historic profitability that has made its way to the balance sheet that they, then, they went, went and turned around and bought in their stock. Had they not done that, their equity account would be approaching $600 billion. So how do you think about that? Well, this company generates so much cash. It has so much liquidity um, that it's, um, it, it's able to do that and the accounting requires it to, to, to mark down the equity account. But realistically, the earnings power of this company is the earnings power of a, comp of, of a company with far more than $134 billion um, of equity. Yeah, so um, the debt to equity ratio is doubly screwed up here in the, the debt here doesn't uh, factor in the huge amount of cash and the equity um, would normally be uh, much, much higher here uh, because, uh, but instead the company, as they buy back, every dollar they buy back stock is a dollar reduction in equity. So if you just look here um, and compare, uh, hold on just a second. Uh, if you compare the equity from 2016 to 2017, only went up by $6 billion but the company earned something like 60 billion in profits. So the equity should have gone up by 60 billion, um, but in fact, they, they turned around and bought back huge amounts of stock, which offsets. So that's why the equity base didn't move up that much. So again, you know, very strange things going on with Apple, good things because it's so, it's so amazingly profitable. So um, let's, um, um, let's now turn to return on equity. And now this is the first ratio where you have to use two of the financial statements. The net income uh, return on equity is basically net income divided by shareholders equity, as you can see in the calculation here. So the net income is pulled off of the income statement. Shareholders equity is pulled off the balance sheet. And the reason this is, if you ask me for one number, one um, ratio that measures the quality quality of a business, uh, I would say return on equity, because at the end of the day, uh, a business exists to earn a profit, but not just it, but the amount of that, that profit uh, depends uh, on how much capital is put into the business. So uh, I don't care just about the total profitability level. I care about the profits that are generated uh, relative to the amount of my money that's tied up in the business. So shareholders uh, or, or stockholders equity uh, measures how much of owner's capital is put into the business. Um, and then net income is how much profit did it earn in a particular year. So imagine if I'm starting up a new business and I take a million dollars out of my bank account and I capitalize the new business and the new business generates $100,000 in profit for me at the end of the first year. That's a 10% return on equity. Um, and you know, that's not bad. Um, if I had taken that same million dollars and bought a treasury note, I might have earned, uh, you know, a 2% return on that. Obviously, it would have been super safe. Investing it in a business is now very risky. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you want to see returns on equity north of 10%. That's what most people would consider to be, you know, the minimum of an acceptable return if you're going to take the risk of investing in a business. Um, if you're investing in a bond, uh, you know, that's the, you'd accept a lower return. And then a super safe bond, like a U.S. Treasury note, which is sort of the benchmark of, of the risk-free rate, um, you'll accept an even lower uh, return on that. So, um, so now, there, there, that is not to say that just return on equity is the be-all and end-all. I'm just saying if there was one number, that's the number that I would start at. So 
in, um, but keep in mind, um, the equity numbers can be very strange. A company like McDonald's, believe it or not, has bought back so much stock that they have negative shareholders equity. So there is no return on equity uh, uh, for McDonald's. Um, in, in, in the case of Apple, um, though, they, they gener they're generating a very healthy return on equity, as you can see from the calculations here. Uh, but that's in part because they've bought back a ton of stock. They've returned excess capital to shareholders that's reduced their equity base. Think of equity as, as it's good in the sense that it represents financial strength, but it's bad in the sense that it represents uh, owner's capital that's tied up in the business. And uh, ideally, uh, the best businesses are ones that don't need a lot of capital tied up. They can return it to shareholders in the forms of dividends and share repurchases thereby reducing uh, their shareholders' equity um, and uh, generating a higher return on equity for the owners. Uh, so here are the calculations for Apple for the last two years. And, and these Whitney, are, Whitney, I'll just yeah. point out here that um, in the sheets that you, uh, you have, the PDFs that, uh, that you all on the phone have, you can't get that 48351 because that's an annual number and you only have the uh, uh, yes. room period numbers. Yes, uh, thank you for pointing that out. So uh, when uh, this slide was put together at, a, at an earlier period, when uh, the financials we were showing uh, reflected a full year as opposed to a quarterly statement. Um, so, so these are numbers just pulled off, uh, off the full year 2016-2017 financials divided by the period ending, end of 2016 equity and end of 2017 equity. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Glenn, uh, to mitigate confusion here. Uh, so uh, hold on just a second and let's uh, move on to, um, so um, return on equity um, is, it's such an important number and it's important to understand, generally speaking, companies are looking to improve their return on equity um, and return on equity mathematically, if you break it down, is, uh, can be f a function of three things. If you want to improve your return on equity, Companies can do three things. They can have a higher profit margin, um, uh, which is generally always a good thing. They can turn their assets faster um, so they can sell more of the products at the same profit margin, um, or they can lever up and they can substitute debt for equity. Uh, they can reduce their equity base. Um, so, you know, any company at any time can just uh, usually can uh, go borrow uh, some money from the bank um, and then pay out a dividend or buy back stock. And there's a dollar for dollar substitution of debt um, and for equity. And that reduces your equity base, improves your return on equity. So you might say, well, that's well, that sounds easy. If, if every company can do it, why doesn't every company go out and do it? And the answer is, is if you take on more and more debt, um, you're making the company are riskier and riskier in the event of downturn, uh, you might go bankrupt uh, if you take it to an extreme. So um, this just, just shows the calculation for higher profit margin is simply net income divided by revenues. In Apple's case, that's about 21%. Uh, let me uh, highlight here. So uh, Apple's net income divided by revenues. Um, and I believe this is, this is for the full year, um, 2017. Again, these numbers aren't the same numbers you'll see on the financials that you have, uh, but trust me on them. So Apple had a 1% profit margin. That's right there. Um, revenues over assets is a measure of how fast you're turning your assets. Um, and then assets over equity is just a measure of leverage. So um, Apple generated, you multiply those three numbers together and uh, that equals Apple's 35.9% return on equity. So the one way to look at these numbers for those of you mathematically inclined, you multiply these three fractions, the revenues cancel each other out, the assets cancel each other out, and what you're left with is, is net income divided by equity, i.e. return on equity. So all we're doing is breaking out return on equity into its three components. So Whitney, a question on the, um, on the board is, would you own a company with negative equity? Um, and as Whitney pointed out, McDonald's has negative equity. Um, um, the person who on the chat suggested that Philip Morris has negative equity. Uh, and my answer to that question is sure. Um, it's just a question of how you got there. If um, a company, w um, I, Apple could very easily have negative equity. They've got enough cash to buy in 100%. They, they have enough cash to buy in $134 billion worth of stock. Uh, they could do that over the next couple of days. 
Um, and that doesn't mean I would not want to own them because they would not be in a dangerous financial position if they did that. Um, so it sort of depends how you get there. If you get there the old fashioned way by just losing money, um, then I probably wouldn't want to own it. Yeah, you want me to throw up, it just occurs to me, Glenn, just pull up here um, on the screen and I can, uh, and I can show people what I'm, what I'm doing here um, with uh, Capital IQ. So let me flip the screen over. And so this is a you know, $20,000 a year uh, subscription service called Capital IQ that we use. Uh, that's very that's very very useful for doing analysis and all. Um, highly recommended if you can afford it. Um, so I'm going to pull up McDonald's um, and um, and let's just take a look at uh, McDonald's balance sheet. So um, so uh, here's a line here for a balance sheet, and here we can quickly see uh, McDonald's balance sheet um, through the current period. Uh, bear with me just a second. So um, if we scroll down. Um, you can see McDonald's equity over the past uh, five years or so has gone from 16 billion to 12.8 billion to 7 billion to negative 2 to negative 3 to negative 5.8 billion dollars. And Capital IQ has a very nice feature here, a charting feature. And you can see 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and this is mid year 2018. So equity is going down and down, which means, by the way, by definition, what this means is, is liabilities exceed assets. That's um, assets minus liabilities. If that's a negative number, by definition, liabilities are bigger than assets. So you're thinking, wow, um, you know, Donald's, uh, the business must really be in full scale uh, collapse. Uh, but in fact, uh, that's not the case. What's been happening is, is uh, let me flip over here to the cash flow statement and you can see um, uh, you can see some pretty cool things on the cash flow statement so let me move it over here so you all can see so you can see cash flow from operations mcdonald's over the last five years has been generating seven six point seven six point five six point oh five point five five point seven um, they've been refranchising a lot of their stores uh, so the business is producing a ton of cash their capital expenditures are much, much lower than cash flow from operations, uh, meaning that there's the business is generating a ton of free cash flow. Uh, so what are they doing uh, with it? Uh, they're paying out uh, $3 billion in dividends pretty consistently. Um, so, so they're paying out a lot in dividends. And keep in mind, they, they had, um, hold on just a second and let me, so I can highlight here. Um, let me pull up my little handy drawing tool. So uh, here you can see they had 5.8 billion of operating cash flow, 2.2 billion of capex. So that's 3.5 billion, let's call it, of free cash flow that they can then uh, uh, return to shareholders. So they take 3.1 billion right here, and they pay out uh, dividends. If you can see that down there. Um, and then, so then you're like, okay, well then that, that works, right? The math works, 3.5 billion of free cash flow, pay out 3.1 billion in dividends. Um, but then here's where what gets interesting is, is they're paying out 6.1 billion um, in share repurchases, repurchase of common stock. Um, and so, well, now the math doesn't work so well, right? Uh, now, now they've got uh, three and a half billion of free cash flow and they're buying back nine, over $9 billion, they're returning to shareholders, 3.1 in dividends, 6.1 in, in uh, share repurchases. So, uh, um, so how is McDonald's funding that? Well, the answer is, is you can see right here, total debt issued of $5 billion last year, in the last 12 months. Um, so they're taking on debt to fund a uh, massive excess return of capital shareholders above and beyond what the business is earning. So now um, you can uh, flip back, let's flip back to the balance sheet. Uh, let me pull up, uh, 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 let me pull that up over here. Let me pull the balance sheet up once again. And uh, to make matters a little easy, I'm just gonna scroll down here and uh, pull up a net debt. And here is a chart of Apple's net debt over the last uh, five years or so. And I'll convert it into a line. And you can see that net debt five years ago was uh, 11.3 billion. Uh, it's now risen to $29 billion. So uh, McDonald's has taken on $18 billion of net debt, net of cash, uh, the past uh, four and a half years or so. 
um, and they've used almost all that to buy back a ton of stock. And so, by the way, let me uh, pull up another chart here, um, the income statement, and uh, let's look at uh, the number of shares outstanding. So we scroll down here to uh, uh, weighted average diluted shares outstanding. We can chart it. And you can see the number of shares four and a half years ago was a little over a billion shares. They're down to 800 million shares. So they bought back 20% of their stock. Um, that means the average shareholder um, has seen a 25% increase in earnings per share, for example, even if earnings are flat, just based on the company retiring one fifth uh, of all of its shares. And that's only in four and a half years. Start multiplying this out over 10 years or 15 years or so, McDonald's isn't going to have very many shares left. Um, and so if they can maintain their profitability, buy back a ton of stock, but the price they're paying is they're taking on a lot of debt to do so. Um, and that debt is piling up on the balance sheet and in fact, tipping them into a negative equity position. But again, if we flip over to the balance sheet uh, and let me just pull up the most recent period. Um, if you look here, um, the, uh, the assets here are uh, $32 billion. Total liabilities are $38 billion. Uh, $30 billion of that, though, is long-term debt, meaning they don't have to repay that back anytime soon. So their current assets of $4.3 billion exceeds their current liabilities of $2.97 billion. So they've got plenty of uh, liquidity here. The McDonald's is a healthy, profitable business. Um, and they can easily meet their short-term obligations and their debt uh, is due over many, many years in the future. Um, it's all appears on their balance sheet today as a liability, of course, but they don't have to pay that off for a long, long time. They can easily cover the interest payments. Uh, so you can see how a company um, through very strategic use of its balance sheet has actually been driving uh, its stock price a lot higher uh, primarily, um, uh, you know, good operations of the business, but also primarily shrinking the share account and growing earnings per share. So the last thing I'm going to pull up here is this is McDonald's share price over the last five years. And you can see over the period of time in which they've engineered, you know, a huge increase in debt to buy back a ton of stock, return capital to shareholders and where equity is tipped negative, the stock has gone by, you know, 60% from about hundred dollars a share to today's level around 160. So uh, pretty, pretty interesting uh, what McDonald's is doing. Um, Apple is in the very, very early stages of doing this. They still have a huge net cash position, a huge positive equity position, but it would not surprise me as Apple's growth slows over time that they start engaging in this kind of financial engineering. Um, and Apple could easily tip to a net debt position, I'm sorry, a and a negative equity position um, and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be much to worry about, though I will say, you know, again, Apple is a technology business and new technologies can come along and rapidly change uh, what may look like a wonderful business into uh, a business that is not so wonderful. Um, so it would be much riskier to execute this kind of strategy with Apple. McDonald's is, you know, a much, much more stable, predictable long-term business. Anything you uh, you uh, want to add over that? Oh, somebody asked uh, Capital IQ versus a Bloomberg terminal. Um, I've never really used a Bloomberg terminal. Um, I th think I got a free trial on Capital IQ, you know, 10 years ago and started using it. Um, Glenn, do you have any comments on, uh, uh, on which, what the differences are, or which you prefer? You know, most, um, most hedge funds uh, have a Bloomberg terminal. Um, it's a, a device that people communicate with and you can get all sorts of quotes and things and a lot of, uh, it's, it's more real time oriented. It's more expensive than capital IQ, more related to trading and uh, wanting to get uh, um, broad, um, a, a broad picture of a variety of securities in the same company, that sort of thing. Um, you know, for a value investor, capital IQ is just terrific because uh, it's, um, it, yeah, it, yeah, I, I would guess that sense too. Um, you know, Bloomberg is um, um, is more is by the way also more bond oriented. I think if you're if you're investing in esoteric securities and so forth, you're probably going to find more data over on Bloomberg. And Bloomberg, I think, is sort of a little more trading oriented, whereas Capital IQ is more stock uh, oriented um, uh, for stock investors. 
and um, uh, I found has you know really good data and good graphing and, and analysis for doing fundamental analysis. Um, right. I mean, there's my... uh, there's no pricing data per se in uh, in uh, Capital IQ other than stock price. Um, and in uh, in Bloomberg, you get a whole lot of um, sort of interesting bond uh, bond uh, pricing and that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, there are a few questions on the chat about uh, pricing of Capital IQ is, is, is I think around $20,000 a year for an individual license. Um, if you can get it through a university or something, obviously that's great. Um, and folks are asking about Centio um, and Morningstar's database. Um, uh, I've just been using Capital IQ just because I've had it for so long, so I haven't really used other stuff. Um, some of my students have told me that there are some other uh, services, you know, 250 bucks a year, that kind of thing, that you know offer uh, a, a good good percentage of the functionality. Um, but um, I'm probably the wrong guy to ask about that. Do you, Do you have any familiarity? I I, with I don't know either, Whitney. I mean, I'm I'm so happy yeah, with what yeah. you that uh, I don't need anything else. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, sorry, we can't answer that question for you guys. So uh, let's flip back to the presentation and uh, keep on going. Um, here we go. Oh, no, that's, uh, uh, let me uh, skip ahead to the right, uh, the right page where we left off. Okay, so um, here we are um, under, I hope you guys can see this all right. Bingo, bingo. Okay, so we finished up return on equity and uh, so now let's do some basic calculations. Um, how much cash uh, does a company have? How much debt does it have? And then subtract one from the other to come up with net cash. Um, then calculate the debt to equity ratio and just exclude cash for now. Just take straight debt divided by equity. Um, and then look at how much is cash growing? How much is debt growing? Um, and then look at inventories and what is the percentage growth rate of inventories. Um, and then calculate the current ratio, which is current assets divided by current liabilities, the quick ratio, which is current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities, and finally return on equity. These are all very simple, quick calculations um, that one can do uh, on a balance sheet. So um, let's just focus on some of the simple ones calculate this for Apple and Costco. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to throw those financial statements up here, um, the ones that we sent out to you. Uh, so this would be um, Apple. And keep in mind, these are six-month differences. Um, th this is not year over year. But this is the end of the last fiscal year through um, the second quarter, uh, March 31st of this year, which is actually not the most re recent one, but it's the most recent one we have here in our slide presentation. And then uh, here's Costco. Sorry, the numbers are a little fuzzy there, but you guys have a printout of this. Uh, so again, I'm going to set my alarm for two minutes um, and uh, crank through. Um, I will just leave this up here uh, for let's calculate some of these numbers for both Apple and Costco.
All right, that's two minutes. Um, so why don't we uh, run through um, net cash or debt, um, starting with um, Apple. And uh, let me pull up the uh, little tool here so I can highlight things for you. Um, so in the case, let's just start with cash. How much cash does Apple have? Very The, the first most simple thing you want to calculate on a balance sheet. Um, in Apple's case, it's a little tricky. In, in every company's case, you just want to add cash and, and marketable securities or short-term marketable securities. Normally, this would just appear on one line. Cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities would just be one line. In Apple's case, they break it down. But here, uh, Apple has so much cash that they're parking some of their cash um, as well uh, in, in more than one-year uh, maturity securities, like two-year treasuries or five-year or 10-year treasuries. Um, so you have to add that up as well. Um, so uh, that's total cash, which is you know 88, 88 billion plus 179 billion. Uh, so that's you know 260 odd billion dollars um, of of cash. Uh, so um, now you want to go look at debt, and you need to look under current liabilities um, under any debt that's due within a year. So uh, that would be here under current portion of long-term debt, but you also have to understand commercial paper is also another word for debt. Um, it's just a short-term short debt. Um, so uh, Costco's total debt's about, uh, short-term debt is $20 billion. And then here they have another 101 billion of long-term debt. And so they got $121 billion of debt. Um, so now um, we calculate net debt, um, and you subtract one from the other, and what number do we get, Glenn? I got $145 billion. All right, so uh, 260, 260-odd billion minus 120 billion gets you $145 uh, billion of net cash. Now keep in mind, though, most of their cash is, is uh, trapped overseas. Now with the new tax law, they're gonna be able to bring that back, um, but that was something, always something to consider in terms of a company's ability to pay out dividends or buy back stock. Um, you know, companies that had a lot of cash offshore uh, trying to avoid paying the taxes, um, they couldn't use that cash. So that's why Apple took on a lot of debt here. Uh, so another thing that you'd want to consider if a company, particularly if you're worried about the amount of debt a company had, is, is you would take all these numbers and just compare it to the previous, uh, in this case, it would be the previous six months earlier, and just take a look at the trends and see, you know, is there anything, uh, uh, anything alarming going on here? Um, and the answer is, is no. Obviously, in the case of Apple, they're drowning in money and, and profits. Uh, you know, debt ticked up about $4 billion. Uh, nothing else much changed here. You know, short-term marketable securities went down. Uh, so did long-term marketable securities. Uh, but this could also be, but the actual amount of cash went up by $25 billion. You know, net-net, this is all just noise. Apple is, uh, is massively profitable. They have no problems on their balance sheet. So um, if we go back to the previous slide, um, uh, let's take a look at the uh, debt to equity ratio. Uh, I think we already uh, calculated that uh, a few slides earlier, but you take up 120 billion of debt um, and um, you divide uh, by total shareholders equity down here. And the debt to equity ratio is a, just a little bit under one. Um, again, not, no problems there. Uh, so now let's uh, take a look at the, the growth rate of debt. That's not even worth calculating here. One thing that's sometimes worth looking at, um, if you're particularly you want to look at the same quarter year over year to avoid seasonality, but taking a look uh, at a company's inventory growth rate um, over two periods. And again, you want to compare, this is not comparing the same year over year. It's a little trickier on the balance sheet. Uh, but comparing, uh, looking at a company's uh, inventory growth over time and making sure, particularly, for example, for a retailer, you want to make sure if the company is growing at 10% a year, you'd like to see inventory growing somewhere around 10% a year. Um, if, uh, if a company grows its revenues 10% and its inventory grows 30%, start to worry. 
um, um, that's not that's not common and it may mean that they're having trouble selling their product or they're stuck with a lot of old obsolete product um, you know technology companies uh, retail companies companies that have perishable uh, products um, you want to keep a close track on inventory and maybe calculate the inventory growth rate uh, so um, current ratio quick ratio and return on equity um, why don't we flip over since we already calculated I showed you these numbers for Apple already um, let's uh, go over to Costco and uh, and, and um, look at some of these numbers uh, Glenn do you want to walk us through uh, some of them sure well um, to uh... by the way I see someone has their hand up um, Chet do you want to uh, um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question Hold on, I can um, I can promote you and uh, turn. Uh, um, so uh, go go ahead, Chet. Uh, we can see you. Let me unmute you. Uh, uh, you may need to un unmute yourself, Chet. Uh, I can see your video, and others can now see you, but um, somehow you're muted. Let me unmute. Um, Chet, there's something at your end um, that's uh, that's keeping you muted. Um, so um, let me uh, until we figure this out, um, just to keep the keep the flow going. Um, can you um, instead uh, type your um, uh, type your question um, on the chat line, and we'll uh, we'll address it there. Uh, sorry, sorry for the technical glitch um, on that. So um, any other questions, by the way, before we move on to Costco here, um, other questions. Um, oh, someone asks here, um, what about return on equity and instead use uh, EBITs instead of net income? Um, that's just not how return on equity is calculated. Um, and um, we'll talk about EBIT in a little bit and how to calculate it. So we'll come back to that. Um, for these ratios, how do you decide if one should buy the stock or not and for what pool of earnings or owner's income? Um, for that, I will, um, I mean, that's more of an investing question, which is, okay, once you've done your analysis and calculated margins, et cetera, uh, then looking at the stock price and deciding if something is a buy or not um, is something that we addressed uh, last Wednesday night in our video, um, which, we video, which we recorded. It was a live session that we did for a couple hours called an introduction to value investing. Uh, so why don't, um, uh, why don't I, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll send around a link to that video uh, for those of you who are interested in sort of applying the analysis of financial statements to then, okay, how do you make uh, good investment decisions and find cheap stocks? Um, that's a whole different level, um, a very different analysis. So, um, uh, you know, given that we have about uh, 40 minutes left today, I think I'm going to punt on that question and send you the link to the video. Um, you know, we could, we could go down, if we start going down the investment rabbit hole, uh, we'll, we'll be here all night. Uh, so, uh, so I'm sorry, Glenn, uh, you, you want to quickly run us through Costco's, um, the calculations for Costco's balance sheet? Sure. So, um, cash is pretty easy. Um, if we look at, uh, the most recent period, which is, uh, the August, uh, I'm sorry, the September, 2017 cash is $4.5 uh, billion dollars. Short-term investments um, are, are cash-like. That's 1.2 billion. So there's approximately 5.8 billion dollars in uh, in cash. Um, debt. Uh, we go down to the uh, liability side, and um, short-term uh, current portion of long-term debt is 86 million dollars. That's uh, uh, let's call that zero um, for our analysis. And long-term debt is 6.6 .6 billion dollars. Um, so the total uh, debt of the company is 6.6. Um, cash we talked about was 5.8. So the net debt of the company, which is the current, which is the cash, uh, which is the debt less the cash, is um, minus $800,000. So um, not not a lot. Um, uh, eight, uh, 800,000 or 800 eight, million? I'm sorry, 800, 800 million, excuse me. Um, I, uh, I got I got it wrong. Yeah, the uh, the cash is 5.8 billion. The debt is uh, 6.6 .6 billion, and the, the net uh, the net debt is uh, 800 billion dollars. So um, so that's uh, that's cash and debt. Um, the current ratio, which um, is current assets divided by current liabilities, is simply 17 billion um, of current assets divided by 17 billion of current liabilities. 
So the, um, uh, the current ratio is approximately one to one. Um, pretty, uh, they, they're making it pretty easy for us at Costco. And then um, the, uh, the, the quick ratio would be the first three items under current assets, which is 4.5 billion plus 1.2 billion plus 1.4 billion. So that's 7.2 billion um, of, uh, of uh, numerator. And the denominator is still the total liability, which is 17.5. And so, so the uh, current liabilities, just to be clear, Glenn. Yes, yes. So, um, so it's seven point two divided by um, seventeen point five, which equals approximately forty one percent. Right. So, Glenn, having um, you know um, that quick ratio uh, is that something? You know, the current assets divided by current liabilities—they're almost exactly the same. Um, but you, you subtract out inventories um, and all of a sudden, you know, Costco does not have enough cash, short-term investments and receivables to cover all its current liabilities. Uh, should we be worried? No. And, and, because, and that's because the Costco model is effectively, um, they get their inventories before, uh, and they sell their inventories before they pay for them. So they have, um, uh, let's say, 30-day terms with a vendor. Um, and they sell their inventory, they turn their inventory more rapidly um, than, than that implies. So if you look at the inventory account, um, there's $9.8 billion, $9 billion of inventories, and that will wash with the $9.6 uh, billion of accounts payable. So while we're deducting yeah. inventory in the, uh, in the quick ratio, uh, just because uh, formulaically that's what you do, that inventory is going to be money good um, because they are turning it so rapidly um, more than once a month. Yeah, yeah. So not, not worrisome at all, given that Costco's, uh, they turn their inventory every, every month. Um, and uh, so, and you don't have risk of product, product obsolescence, uh, technology, you know, inventory going bad. Uh, so this is, you know, this is, uh, makes sense given the nature of Costco's business and the nature of their inventories. But for other companies, uh, you'd be really worried. It, it depends on the company and the context. Yeah, if it, if it was Gap, I would worry more. The Gap, the uh, the clothing retailer, uh, which is right. uh, item two. Or the uh, the fashion component of Costco is uh, is you know is Colgate toothpaste going to go out of style? Yep. So, so um, what's the next ratio? Let's see what other. Let's just flip back to um, other. Um, so we've sort of looked at inventory. Um, you, you know, here you might want to calculate the growth of inventory. You know, and the inventory growth rate's about ten percent, I guess, right? Just eyeballing it, it's about eight percent, which is approximately the same growth rate that the uh, that that sales are growing at. Uh, exactly what you would expect. Uh, Costco is a very very disciplined uh, retailer, and uh, that that would that's what I would expect. Um, any other calculations? Do we want to do debt to equity ratio here, just to you know show them where the numbers are? Sure. Well, we, we calculated the long-term debt is six point six billion dollars, and the total equity is um, eleven billion dollars. So um, it's about fifty-five percent debt to uh, debt to equity, um, right. which which is plenty healthy for uh, for a company like this. Costco also yeah, that's, that's not it. even counting the 5.8 billion in cash uh, you got up here. Right, right. Um, which uh, so basically Costco has a has almost a a flat uh, no uh, you know only a very slight amount of net debt um, for a company that's generating over two billion dollars of, um, of profit every year, um, and so Costco is very conservative financed, um, very strong financially, um, probably too strong financially in the sense that they could probably uh, start paying a bigger dividend and or buy back a lot more stock in light of the enormous strength of their balance sheet combined with the enormous strength of their income statement. And, and we'll get to their cash flow shortly, but that obviously tells the same story as well. And, and, um, anything and more think, to cover on the balance sheet? Um, um, I, think, I think we got the return on equity still. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, for reminding me on that. So, 
Um, let me, uh, let's uh, shoot back uh, while you're walking people through it. I'll, sh I'll shoot back a few pages here. Um, so so, so we, you, we got us. If you remember the uh, net income at Costco was uh, $2.679 uh, billion for, uh, right. for the recent year. Um, and their um, equity count is $11 billion. So that equates to a, um, a healthy 20, 4% return on equity, um, uh, approximately. Uh, that's 2.679 divided by 11 billion. So um, you can see that Costco's return on equity is very, very strong. 24 is a very good number um, relative to sort of the 10% the threshold that Whitney was talking about, despite having low margins. And the reason right. is because of that DuPont formula that Whitney went through and the, 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 the key to, um, to Costco is they turn over their uh, asset. Their, the revenue divided by asset turnover is very, very high at Costco. So the, the lever they're pulling is the middle lever. Yes, yeah, because they only have a 2% profit margin down here compared to Apple's 21%. Yet Costco, you multiply these numbers out and that's because uh, they turn their inventory so quickly, revenues over assets, exactly as Glenn said. Uh, so that's uh, Costco is generating a very high return on equity despite having very low profit margins because uh, they they have a very high velocity, very high turn of their inventory and their assets. Um, so I think we've covered uh, covered most of these here. Um, these are very, very simple calculations, folks, um, but they can tell you a lot of important information. Um, you know, on the balance sheet, you're looking at measures of financial strength look immediately to cash and debt. Um, if, if you have a net debt position, calculate the debt to equity ratio and see and look at trends over time, compare it to other companies in the same sector um, and sort of use common sense about the nature of the business. Um, uh, and then look at what's happening to debt and cash uh, over time. Um, do a quick calculation of the current ratio and the quick ratio. Make sure inventory growth is sort of mirroring uh, sales growth. Um, and look to see what return on equity is um, uh, over time. So let me just pull up, Glenn. Uh, you know, while uh, while we're doing, you know, let me just show you how um, over here on uh, Capital IQ. Let's let's pull up Costco, um, and uh, because it's so much easier on Capital IQ to pull up some of this data. Um, so uh, so for example, um, uh, let's just look at some uh, ratios here. And this pulls up, uh, you know, five years of data, but we can, you know, you know, let's go back and extend it 10 years. Um, and let's just look at uh, return on equity, uh, not uh, return on equity for Costco and chart it. And uh, you can see Costco's return on equity well, back in 2009 was 11%. And every single year that number has been going up and it's now reached 27% in the latest quarter. That's just a spectacular, beautiful thing that you love to see. So now let's uh, look at what its uh, gross margin has done over time, uh, historically. And you can see that gross margin is basically rock solid. Uh, they, the Costco's business model, they are not trying to increase their gross margin. That is not their business model. Um, and so you can see though, uh, their net margin actually I think has moved up a little bit. Uh, let's take a look at it, okay? So here's net margin was down here at 1.52% 10 years ago, 1.67647294, It finally crossed the 2% threshold in 2015 and uh, is right up there just above 2%. So there has been an increase in their net margin, you know, one and a half percent to 2.16% is actually, you know, a, a 35, 40% increase. Um, so, um, Costco, but Costco's business model is pass all the savings along to the customers and instead uh, just sell tremendous volume. Um, so that's where you start to see, uh, let me just pull up the income statement and we'll pull up 10 years and you can see, um, you know what, I'm going to pull up, you know, off the top of my head, I'm going to pull up 20 years just to show the incredible growth story here. Um, so this goes back to 1999 when they had 27 billion and look at that growth number of revenues. So they start out at 27 billion down here 
and they're up to $139 billion of revenues over the last 20 years, just cranking it out. And look during the, the Great Recession in here, revenues went from 72 billion down to 71 billion, virtually no hiccup at all, because this is even during a severe recession, people are still need to buy toilet paper and Cheerios and basic things, and Costco's offering the best value proposition out there. You know, underselling Walmart, Costco is generally underselling Walmart by 20 to 30 uh, percent, based on a similar basket of items, uh, if I recall correctly. Um, right. Any other, anything else I should throw up here on Costco while I've got Capital IQ, just to um, show what sort of um, some more analysis we can do? Is that nosy I hear? Um, so, um, oh, so uh, Yaroslav asks, is Costco a defensive stock as well as a growth stock? And the answer is yes. Um, the problem is, is it's defensive and it's a growth stock. The problem is, is as we're going to see shortly, um, it's trading at a pretty high multiple. So you're paying a fairly rich price, well above market, uh, to own an incredible company like Costco. And keep in mind, uh, Costco, you know, if you believe the world over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years is increasingly going toward everybody buying everything uh, online. Um, um, then you know that may really impact Costco's growth rate, and you could see Costco's uh, multiple compress. I'm I'm not, not sure that you actually would see a decline in earnings uh, or profitability, but you could certainly see a significant slowing, and that would uh, definitely affect what investors are willing to pay on a multiple of its earnings. Um, and it's a pretty high multiple, so that multiple could compress. Um, uh, you know, this can still be an insanely great company going forward, but it not, might not be an insanely great stock. So uh, let me flip back to uh, the presentation and let's uh, talk about the cash flow statements. All right, so the cash flow statement is tracking uh, a company's actual cash. And I'm actually throwing a couple numbers here that are taken off the income statement, but they are, uh, I'm lumping them in under cash flow. Um, and just look at the different ways that people can, uh, when they're talking about cash flow, what they're talking about. So uh, one one measure, of course, is 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 can people just talk about profit. That would be net income, earnings, the bottom line, profit. All that's just the bottom uh, the bottom line, net income on the income statement. But there's some other metrics people use. So let me just uh, familiarize you with them. Um, one is EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes. So. Um, there, and this is again taking Apple for a full year, um, so it's not consistent uh, quite with the quarterly numbers that you have, but it's just taking net income, add back taxes, add back interest, and that's EBIT. EBIT, generally speaking, is for most companies is the same as operating income. Uh, so um, this is uh, pre-tax and pre, uh, pre-interest payment. And so if, if someone's looking at putting a lot of debt on the company and taking it private, like this is what LBO, uh, leverage buyout uh, companies would look at. Um, and in fact, they would look at the next number even more, which is EBITDA, which is, at, which is taking EBIT and then also adding back depreciation and amortization, which is what's on the cash flow statement. And those of you who took the seminar live uh, last week, will recall that depreciation and amortization is a non-cash charge that is charged on the income statement. And so when uh, someone wants to look at the actual cash being generated by the business, um, you want to add back uh, the uh, major non-cash charge of depreciation and amortization. Uh, I'm not going to dive in uh, and, and repeat what I taught a week ago um, in terms of going into the details of depreciation and amortization and where it appears on the cash flow statement, et cetera. Uh, we covered that in some depth uh, a, a week ago, and uh, you can go back and watch the video if you want the, the explanation there. So um, another metric is free cash flow, and this is taken generally straight off the cash flow statement, unlike um, uh, EBIT and EBITDA, which are mostly uh, off the income statement, and then in the case of EBITDA, adding back depreciation and amortization from the cash flow statement. Free cash flow, um, a lot of people will define this differently. And by the way, if you ask 10 experts to calculate Apple or Costco's free cash flow, you might well get 10 slightly different answers. But the idea here is, is to look at cash flow from operations, uh, the top third of the cash flow statement, um, and then do a subtraction for capital expenditures. Now, 
Um, um, the, the difference here though is companies, um, companies have what's called maintenance capex and growth capex. Um, and, but it all just appears as one line on the cash flow statement. Um, so, um, uh, so let me uh, flip over actually and, and let me show you what, uh, for example, Costco's cash flow statement looks like, if you bear with me just a second. Um, I'm going to go here and let me pull up uh, Costco's cash flow statement, which is this page right here. And um, okay, so here's Costco's cash flow statement. And uh, let's just look at free cash flow. So um, um, you would take cash flow from operations, $6.7 billion. Um, and then you would look at additions to property and equipment, which um, many people also, many uh, cash flow statements would call that capital expenditures or CapEx. And that's $2.5 billion. And that's what Costco spent on buying uh, land, property, trucks, hard goods that appear on the balance sheet, by the way. So, so just, just for perspective, um, Costco spent $2.5 billion in the fiscal year ending uh, last a year ago, September. Um, let's, um, let's just flip back to the balance sheet uh, to see where this number appears. And here's the balance sheet. Up top, you have property and equipment here. Um, and property and equipment um, grew from 26 billion uh, hold on just a second, 26 billion here to 28.3 billion. And that reflects the capital expenditures that you see on the cash flow statement. Then you have the depreciation um, uh, shown here um, of that. So this is what they paid up here, minus the depreciation as uh, something decays in value over time, things wear out, trucks wear out, uh, they need to be replaced, et cetera. Um, so that's what you're seeing on the balance sheet. Um, so now let's flip back to the cash flow statement and talk about uh, free cash flow here. Here we go, cash flow statement. So um, this uh, the simple simple way to calculate um, uh, free cash flow would just be to take 6.7 billion minus 2.5 billion and say that the company's got 4.2 billion of free cash flow. What this misses, however, is, is that Costco is building new stores and that's growth CapEx, okay? So uh, a lot of what Costco is spending is just to replace um, things that wear out, computers, refrigerator display cases, trucks, you name it, right? But then they're also spending a lot of money to open new stores every year. And so, um, um, so that decision to open new stores is a capital allocation decision. Costco doesn't have to open new stores every year. Whereas in order to maintain its business, it definitely has to spend to replace the things that break down and wear out, right? So um, the question is, is uh, the way I think about free cash flow is um, operating cash flow and then subtract out my best estimate of what maintenance CapEx is. Then that tells me how much money the company has to allocate and first and foremost, it can reinvest back in the business. That would be growth CapEx, um, in addition to buying inventory and all the other things that reinvesting in the business. But then you look further down the cash flow statement and you can see uh, that they could pay down debt with some of their excess cash flow. Uh, they could buy back stock um, or they could uh, pay out uh, dividends. Um, those are all uses of cash. They could also make acquisitions. Costco doesn't tend to make acquisitions, so you do it here but that's certainly another use of cash flow. So, so you might be saying, okay, Whitney, well, all right, where's the line for maintenance CapEx? All I'm seeing here is one line, which includes growth as well. And the answer is, is um, you can ask the company, um, but, but a good proxy is depreciation. Um, so that's what you're seeing up here. Uh, that was the yearly depreciation charge, and that reflects the decay in value of all of their hard assets and so that's often a pretty good proxy. And in Costco's case, my guess is, is that this is probably pretty accurate. They're spending 1.4 billion on depreciation. That's probably what they need to spend in maintenance CapEx. And the additional 1.1 billion, totaling 2.5 billion, is growth CapEx, right? So my, the way I think, I, the way I would calculate my best estimate, and this is just an estimate, it's not precise, would be to take 6.7 billion of operating income subtract out 1.4 billion of depreciation and amortization uh, as an estimate of, of uh, maintenance CapEx, and that would give me uh, $5.3 billion 
of free cash flow, of which they then took 1.1 billion and reinvested back into growth capex. Uh, they paid down some debt, but interestingly, they took on some debt as well. So net net, they actually took on debt, um, uh, but then they used it to, to pay a very big dividend. Now here's sort of interesting. They paid $3.9 billion in dividends. The previous year, they spent 746 million. Uh, and that's pretty unusual. Um, let's, let's scroll down and, uh, and look at this here. Um, so to highlight this again, to highlight these numbers again, um, you can see they're very steadily purchasing back, you know, 400 to 500 million of stock. What unusual is, is they have a big uh, dividend payment here, then very little here, and then a much bigger payment here. And again, you know, that's, a, that's unusual. Usually companies like to pay steady dividends. And what you're seeing here actually is Costco, every time they accumulate a bunch of cash, um, they look at their stock price and they say, you know what, our stock price is trading at a pretty high multiple. We think that the best way to return ca this excess cash to our shareholders is to buy back a lot of, uh, is, I'm sorry, not to buy back a lot of stock, but instead to pay out a big special dividend. So if you scroll up to the income statement, um, and this, this is the statement that you have, you guys can look at this. You can see the dividends per share um, down at the very bottom of the income statement was they paid a big special dividend two years ago. Their regular quarterly dividend totaling a buck 70 a share last year. And then they paid another big special dividend uh, of over $7 a share last year. So um, that's that's Costco's policy. They're, they're gonna maintain a very conservative balance sheet, roughly equal amounts of debt and equity. Um, they're not buying back a lot of stock because it's trading at a pretty high multiple. So the most efficient way to return capital to shareholders is, is as the excess cash piles up, they periodically pay out a big dividend. Uh, but it's not predictable. They don't promise it. Um, um, the only thing that's promised is, is the very low steady dividend that you see here um, that they'll always maintain. But then uh, you get the special dividend on top of it uh, at times. Uh, Glenn, anything you want to add on um, on Costco's uh, cash flow statement here? No, I think um, what uh, Costco does incredibly well is they are very disciplined. And if you look at their board of directors, which includes Charlie Munger, that shouldn't be a huge surprise. Um, and they they understand the the way to um, to run the business efficiently. They don't want to push it. Um, aggressively they just want to run it the way you know grow, growing the, the the number of stores but not increasing the leverage uh in the balance sheet and the the stock bounces all around based on amazon coming in and competing and buying whole foods and such uh, and it tends to bounce back because it's just a wonderful business model that's um uh it's hard to find a company that executes better yeah yeah really a superb company but let's, um, in the next uh, 15 minutes, and we'll probably go a little over, that's okay. Um, anyone needs to log off can always come back and watch the video. But I wanna quickly run through valuation metrics and then we're gonna end with a five company exercise. Uh, so um, valuation, um, there are a lot of different ways to think about valuation. And some people you know, start with book value, which is shareholders equity. Um, and that's stated on the balance sheet and it's calculated according to GAAP, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, and it's mathematical. It's simply assets minus liabilities. That is not the same as the market value, um, uh, the market capitalization, which we'll calculate, which is shares times the share price. Um, and book value often has absolutely nothing to do with the true valuation of the company. In fact, as, as I mentioned, uh, McDonald's has negative book value, but obviously it's an extremely valuable company. Uh, so the company's true value is based on many variables, including expected future cash flows of the firm, its market position, size, growth potential, risk, competition, employee and management quality, investors weigh all of those things. So let's just talk about uh, six different valuation ratios or metrics that you should at least be familiar with. Um, 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 market capitalization is an, an enterprise value or not actually valuation ratios, but um, they, they show how the, mar how the mar company is being valued by investors. And then there's some sort of calculations um, of multiples uh, that give you a sense is, is, is a stock richly priced or not. So the market cap is super simple. It's just the number of shares times the share price. So Apple, as of today's close at $220.03 a share, 
times 4.83 billion diluted shares, has, has a market cap of a little over a trillion dollars, 1.062.7 billion. Now, enterprise value simply um, says, you know, if a company is valued at a billion dollars, has a hundred million, has a hundred billion of debt and no cash, the actual to own the whole company, you'd have to pay the billion dollars plus the hundred million of debt you'd have to assume. So the enterprise value adjusts for debt and cash. So you add the debt to the enterprise value, then you subtract out the cash. And in Apple's case, because um, they've got so much uh, net cash, uh, the, the cash uh, significantly exceeds the debt. Um, you, so you adjust for those, so you add the debt, subtract the cash, and Apple's enterprise value is actually lower than its market cap because it has a net cash position um, of 933.6 billion. So now um, the most common valuation metric for a, uh, for a stock is the price to earnings ratio. So you take the share price divided by the earnings per share um, and, and in the case of Apple, um, we're going to use um, the trailing 12-month earnings. Now, some people might use estimated 2018 earnings. Some people might say it's trading uh, at a certain multiple of next year's expected earnings. Um, but in this case, I think the most conservative thing to do is just use trailing earnings. And so doing the calculation here for Apple, you get 19.9. Uh, so Apple's trading at 20 times earnings. So what that means is is that if Apple's earnings stay absolutely steady going forward and you buy the stock for $220, the company is going to take tw uh, 20 years to earn um, in profits, um, earnings per share, your share of those profits. It's going to take 20 years to get back your money. So does that sound, assuming the company pays out all of its earnings to you in a dividend, so does that sound like a good deal to you that you know you you buy you buy a share of Apple stock for 220 bucks and then they give you all their profits for the next 20 years and only then do you get back your 220 bucks right that sounds like a miserable deal it, that would be a miserable deal um, so what the variable here though is that investors are betting that Apple's earnings per share grow um, and that it's going to take a lot less than 20 years for Apple to earn uh, to earn its share price. And by the way, even if it took 20 years to get your money back for Apple, if the company was still highly profitable um, and you own Apple for 30 or 40 or 50 years, um, you know, maybe maybe taking 20 years to, to get your money back isn't bad if, uh, if, if you can continue uh, uh, generating and, and pocketing those earnings for a lot more years. So, so um, um, you know, just FYI, the general stock market, the S&P 500 today, depending on how you calculate it, is trading in high teens. Call it 18 times earnings. By some metrics, it's trading at 24 times or even higher multiple, but just based on, I think based on 2018 earnings estimates, and we're forced to the way through the year now, you know, I think the S&P is uh, up in the high teens, the latest numbers I saw. So you can see that Apple's trading, you know, right around the level of the average company in the S&P 500. And this is why some people say, you know, hey, Apple even now is the world's most valuable company and the stock's been a monster over any time period you care to look at. People like Warren Buffett, who's been buying a lot of Apple, um, thinks it's cheap because you're paying a market multiple for a company that is vastly superior to the average company in the S&P 500. Much higher margins, much higher returns on equity, and the, the, these people would argue uh, much better growth prospects. So another way to look at, uh, another multiple to look at that is often used by buyout guys is enterprise value to EBITDA. So instead of taking price to earnings, which is market cap divided by profits, Instead, you're taking the full enterprise value, factoring in the debt and cash, and you're dividing it by a pre-tax and, 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 and what some people would say is a real cash flow number. Now, keep in mind, it doesn't factor in CapEx. This is not free cash flow. So EBITDA, in almost all cases, overstates a company's earnings because it adds back depreciation and amortization, but doesn't, uh, doesn't subtract for CapEx, which is a very real expense. Um, so I think this is sort of a bullshit number, but it's one you should at least be familiar with. So um, in almost all cases, enterprise value to EBITDA is going to be a significantly lower multiple. So companies like to use it uh, because it, it justifies a higher share price. So you can see that Apple trading at almost 20 times a PE ratio is trading at 12 times enterprise value to EBITDA. 
Again, sort of a bullshit metric, be very careful using this, but sometimes it can be helpful, to, for example, to compare different companies um, in, in the same sector who have different levels of debt and cash, for example. Um, another metric here is price to sale ratio, which is simply the market cap um, uh, divided by the revenues. Um, so Apple's trading at 4.2 times uh, revenues. Again, nobody really cares what revenues are. People, investors care about what profits are. Uh, but again, this could be uh, sometimes helpful looking at this on a historical basis um, or comparing one company to another. So if a company's earnings are very depressed or even negative, you won't have a PE ratio uh, at all or one that makes sense. Um, so, you know, looking at uh, and saying that one retailer that's out of favor trades at 0.2 times sales and another company that, that is really in favor trades at 0.8 times sales might be an indication that, that the one trading at 0.2 times sales, uh, that, that, that that stock is cheap if the company can revert to more normal industry uh, level margins, for example. So not a completely useless metric, but, um, but not a great one either. Um, and lastly, a price to book ratio is uh, often used to value financial companies um, uh, um, the, the, where their equity is, uh, is uh, what banks and, and insurance companies use, for example. So, so um, some people, including ourselves, look at uh, Berkshire Hathaway, for example, on a price to book ratio. Uh, so it, it doesn't make any sense for a company like uh, Costco or Apple, um, but we just show the number here for Apple. It's trading at 9.2 times uh, its book value, just market cap divided by equity. Um, it's a meaningless number here, but um, you know, for example, um, if you're looking to compare, you know, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, two very similar investment banks, and you know, Morgan Stanley is trading at a higher price to book multiple than Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, you might argue, you could say, uh, you could say that Morgan Stanley is more in favor with investors because it trades at a higher price to book multiple, um, and maybe that's an argument that Goldman is cheap and that it, it will once again return to glory and its multiple will trade up. You know, that's how investors, uh, you know, might take a first quick cut at, at, at those kind of companies. So um, let's, uh, rather than pausing for two minutes, given the shortness of time, I'm just gonna, I have slides here showing all of these calculations for Costco, which closed today at uh, $233.92. Um, so here's the market cap, 440.9 million diluted shares off outstanding, taken straight off the income statement, multiplied by the share price. And uh, so Costco is roughly one tenth the market cap of Apple, a little over a hundred billion dollars. Apple's a little over a million. Um, enterprise value is almost the same as the market cap because debt and cash are almost the same. The PE multiple um, is share price divided by the trailing uh, earnings per share. Um, and uh, that's 34X. Now keep in mind, Apple was 19.9X, call it 20X. So Costco is trading a substantially higher PE multiple than Apple. Now that's sort of interesting, isn't it? Um, investors are willing to pay a much higher multiple to own a dollar of Costco's earnings relative to Apple's earnings. Um, but we showed you earlier, we calculated that Apple has is growing much faster, has much higher margins, has a much higher return on equity. So what could explain this? And the answer is, is that investors believe that Apple's, or, excuse me, that Costco's earnings are going to grow quite a bit more over a long period of time than Apple's. And there are a couple reasons they believe that is, and also that, that Costco's earnings are more predictable and safer, and therefore um, they're willing to pay a higher multiple for that safety. Um, but, and, and that may not be unreasonable. Apple is running into the law of large numbers. It has almost a quarter trillion dollars in sales. Um, it, there's an argument to be made that virtually every human being on earth that will ever want to own an iPhone already owns an iPhone. Um, you know, as, as more and more of the world's population gets on smartphones, those, that growth is coming almost exclusively in less developed uh, countries. Um, and, you know, there just aren't a lot of poor farmers in India and Africa um, and rural people in China who are getting their first smartphones who are getting iPhones. Uh, so, you know, Apple is trying to go after the lower end market by creating a whole line of products with them, you know, the iPhone X at the top. But, uh, stripped down models um, um, to try and cater to that. But um, 
there's an argument that um, that the law of large numbers is, is going to kick in, that Apple's growth must inevitably slow quite dramatically from here. Um, there's also the technology risk and unpredictability. Apple only has something like 15 to 18% market share um, by revenues uh, of the worldwide smartphone market. Now, they make 80% of the profits because they have a unique differentiated high margin product. Um, but again, there are real questions about Apple's ability to grow um, and about Apple's market cap of over a trillion dollars to keep growing from here. Whereas Costco's a big company, um, but you know, well under half the size of Apple by revenues, and it's only one tenth the size in terms of its market cap. And uh, therefore, there's an argument to be made that Costco has a lot more room to grow than Apple, um, and that its earnings uh, stream going forward is much safer. Um, and therefore, uh, investors are, are willing to award it a substantially higher PE multiple. Anything, uh, Glenn, um, you, you'd want to add to that? Um, no, um, I uh, and and it may be that one is a better value than the other. The market is, you know, if the market was truly 100% um, efficient, we probably all wouldn't be here. Yeah. Um, by the way, I just uh, noticed a couple quick questions here. Uh, why use EBITDA versus uh, cash flow from operations? Yeah, I was I was I was addressing those on the chat line. Um, Whitney, so if, if you want to keep moving okay. just so from I'll a timing just, perspective. I'll just keep cranking away and you can address some of the questions on the chat. Okay. So um, here's um, um, uh, Costco's EBITDA. Um, again, not, not very many people are going to use EBITDA to value Costco. They don't have a meaningful amount of debt, but uh, you, know, you just add back the taxes, the interest, the DNA, um, and EBITDA is obviously a lot higher than net income. Therefore, if you do enterprise value divided by EBITDA, um, you come up with uh, a much lower number, um, a multiple of 19.1 instead of 34. Uh, again, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to use this metric in Costco's case because it's it's not a heavily levered company, what have you. And Costco, though, interestingly enough, you remember Apple trades at 4.2 times revenues. Costco trades at 0.8 times revenues. In other words, has 103 billion of uh, market cap and 129 billion of revenues. Um, and this reflects that uh, it's a retailer. It's a much lower margin business. Um, and, um, you know, keep in mind, Apple's got a 21% profit margin off its profits. It's earning 21 cents of profit for every dollar of sales. And, and Costco earns two cents of profit per dollar of sales. Um, so not surprisingly, it trades at a much lower um, price to sales ratio because it's not nearly as profitable. Um, and lastly, price to book is equally meaningless for Costco as it is for Apple, but we just wanted to show you the math. Just take um, the market cap divided by equity. Um, this uh, only use price to book really when you're uh, talking about uh, financial companies. So um, let me uh, let's finish with an exercise here, um, and uh, let me pull it up here called Figures Are Revealing, and uh, let me uh, highlight this uh, this page. And here it is uh, on two slides. So here is where uh, we're going to take uh, five companies, um, eBay, Barnes & Noble, Kroger, a grocer, American Electric Power, an electric utility company, um, and uh, Sherwin-Williams, uh, a paint business. Um, and uh, we're going to show uh, a bunch of data. So let me, uh, now that you know what those five companies are, let's, uh, let me scroll down here and show you the data. So at the, the top part here, um, is, um, is, a, is the company's balance sheet for each of the five companies. Your job is to figure out which column is which company. Um, and everything here has been normalized to 100. So you can see 100%. So you can see total assets and total liabilities plus equity are both equal to 100. So to give you an example, this says that 18% of a company's total assets are in inventories. 57% is in property and equipment, plants and equipment. Whereas over here, company C, only 6% um, of their total assets are in property, uh, plants, and equipment. Um, so that's the top here. So here, looking at long-term debt, one company has only 11% of its balance sheet in long-term debt. Uh, this company over here, it's 49% is, is, uh, is long-term debt. So um, now let's just turn to the bottom. And these are some of the uh, metrics that we were calculating. Um, current ratio uh, and quick ratio. Um, you can see, um, you know, company C has is 
very, very strong, very high current and, and quick ratios. You know, uh, company A here uh, and company B are much lower. Here are your gross operating and net margins. Again, massive differences. One company has a 14% net margin. A couple companies here have a 1% net margin. Huge differences as well in uh, the gross margin, 23% versus 77%. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time on asset turns, assets divided by equity or return on assets, but that's the, the ratio, the DuPont ratio that gives you return on equity. You can see company D only generates a 3% return on equity. Company E generates a 52% return on equity. And then lastly, um, days of receivable and days of inventory. We didn't show you how to calculate that, but it, it is what it sounds like. So company A takes five days on average to, uh, to collect its receivables and takes 27 days to sell its inventory. Um, company C has no inventory whatsoever, um, but takes 24 days to collect its receivables. Uh, company D collects receivables in only seven days. So think about receivables, cash, there is no receivable, but if it's a company collecting credit cards, for example, they're gonna collect very quickly. Uh, companies selling to other businesses, uh, might take a month or two to get paid, right? So that's what you'll see in days receivable. Um, and some companies have no, no inventory, uh, I'm sorry, uh, days inventory. They have no inventory. Um, some companies take a month. Uh, company D here, think about what company might have the better part of, uh, you know, uh, so what company would fit that description? So why don't we just take two minutes and let you guys, um, uh, you know, take a stab at this. You know, let's give it. Uh, we'll give it three minutes, um, and then, uh, Glenn, um, why don't you? Uh, you can walk people through um, uh, the answers um, and, and why why those answers are what they are. All right. Um, so I'm setting my timer for three minutes and uh, get to work. All right, that's three minutes. Um, so, uh, Glenn, you want to talk us through it, and I'll um, I'll highlight things as you talk about them. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so one of the keys in exercises like this is to look for outliers uh, and see where companies are differentiated from the other uh, companies on the list. So let's um, let's start with um, with a company like eBay. Um, eBay is an intermediary. Um, they, uh, they're an auction house. They do not take possession of the goods and they, uh, that they sell to other people. So that would be a business that would have um, uh, zero or almost zero inventory. Um, and it would be an extremely high margin business because effectively there's no cost of goods sold. Um, they're just simply uh, um, taking a commission on, on items that are sold. So when I look at the, uh, at the alternatives here, I see that the highest gross margin business is number C. So that would, um, letter C, that would fit uh, to eBay. Um, there are no inventories, and that would fit to eBay. And um, I, uh, I think that would be enough uh, for me to triangulate um, into, uh, um, into eBay for that one. Um, so that would knock off C. When I look at day's inventory, the last line, line item, line item number 23, there's one that sticks out there. It's 167 days. Now, just to make sure that that's, uh, that's a, um, um, not 167 days on a very small inventory base, I would look up, uh, up uh, atop uh, line item three, and um, company D has 54% of, um, uh, of their capital structure, of their at total assets in inventory. So this is a very inventory-heavy uh, business, and it's a, a company that turns its inventory um, slowly, uh, it takes 167 days to turn over their inventory. And so when you look at this list of companies, it pops out. Um, if you've ever been in a Barnes and Noble store, they have a whole lot of books on the shelf. That's their inventory. They don't turn those books very often. They keep uh, dictionaries in there for years at a time and um, um, uh, classics uh, of literature. So that would, um, I think that D would be an outlier that, that points to, uh, to Barnes and Noble. Um, it, next, um, so we've, we've got C and D off the list. When I look at yeah, A and by, by the way, uh, Glenn, um, um, just look at the whole. I mean, this is a really crappy, struggling business, which 
which you're also seeing here, right? Um, yeah, well, you see that in their, their ROE. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, go ahead. So, okay, so, so now um, I'm looking at uh, specifically the, the uh, line item five, the net plant and equipment, and A and B are both very plant equipment uh, heavy companies. Um, uh, and, and so I would, I would look at this list and say, well, I don't know all of these companies that are left Kroger, um, uh, the power company and Sherwin Williams could all have a lot of plant and equipment. Let me go down and look at the margin structure and, um, the gross margin of company A is 23%. Um, B is, um, materially higher and E is materially higher. So I think about which of these businesses um, would, would likely be the lowest margin business, uh, I would naturally think that it's Kroger because they're a retailer um, and they're marking up their um, inventory to make a profit on it, but you can't, um, you can't make 50, 60, 70% gross margins on bananas and, uh, and toothpaste. Um, so it, it, I, would, I would say that the lower margin structure would likely be, um, uh, um, which is A, would likely be Kroger. Um, if I look at the inventories, tr they turn their inventories every um, every 27 days. That seems to make sense um, from a uh, um, uh, an inventory management perspective. Um, they have zero accounts payable. Um, well, that makes sense, right? Because you pay in cash, um, and uh, so so that all lines up for A. So that would that would uh, that would lead you to this, believe uh, that. Glenn, uh, Glenn they, um, um the, you're looking at notes payable is zero. They do have a little bit of accounts payable up here. Um, um, and, uh, and it's the days receivable because their customers. Right, are right. I'm sorry. Cash. I'm sorry. I, 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 I said that backwards. The days receivable, the accounts receivable is very little because the customer's paying in cash. Uh, thank you, Whitney. Okay. The, uh, the accounts payable is what, when they're pay, uh, paying their suppliers. So they're, um, mm -hmm. they don't have any float off of their customers but they are um, uh, taking float off of their right. suppliers. Um, right. so, so, so that they- Similar to Costco, um, the, um, the accounts payable and the inventories that I'm highlighting here are almost exactly the same. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we saw with Costco. Um, you know, they take delivery of product, they have an accounts payable, they sell it within 30 days, it's inventory. So the accounts payable and inventory matches up, they sell it in 30 days and they're good to go. So, um, so let's now look at um, uh, a AEP. Uh, it's a power company. So you would think that they have a very, very high level of plant property and equipment. Um, their accounts receivable, um, you would think would be quite low. Um, you would think that their accounts payable um, would also be uh, very low. It's just a, um, uh, a utility and there's no payable and receivable uh, dynamic in it. Um, uh, utilities, often finance themselves uh, to a certain degree with debt. Uh, and um, uh, so, so if we look at what's left uh, B and E, um, D has uh, very low receivables, uh, very low payables, very high plant property and equipment. Um, uh, they've got some debt in the capital structure and they're earning a 12% net income margin, which is a, um, sounds like a regulated utility margin. Um, if you've ever uh, participated in the, in the, uh, regulated, regulated utility business, um, that would point you to, uh, to B, um, being AEP and that would leave A as Sherwin Williams, the paint business, just no, to triangulate. E, e, e. I said, uh, didn't I say E? So you said e, A. So E is the paint business. It's got 47% gross margins. Um, that, that makes sense. It's a value added product. Um, it has net margins um, of 8%. Uh, to some degree, that's because it's a levered company. Uh, if you go up to the, the, the debt, um, it's, it's 50% of the capital structure is, uh, is in debt. They have 68% in total long-term assets. That would be a little bit of a confusing one, and I wish that we uh, we were in a room together. But basically, they made an acquisition of another paint company called Valspar, and um, that's goodwill associated with that acquisition. Um, so that's uh, that's what that 68% um, uh, is. It's a very high return on equity business, 52%. So it's a good business. The paint business is historically a, a very good business. So uh, just to recap, A is Kroger. B is AEP, C is eBay, 
D is Barnes and Noble and E is Sherwin Williams. Right. Um, one other thing, I mean, the hardest one here are the last ones. And as Glenn uh, was teaching, you know, B and E, the utility in the paint business, um, you know, uh, uh, had had quite a bit of similarities um, and, you know, similar, mar somewhat similar margin structures, similar days receivable and days inventory. Um, and if you didn't know that one company had made a very large acquisition and taken on a lot of goodwill, um, you know, um, you, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have understood this right here. So one of the big giveaways though, is, is there is no such thing as a regulated entity that the regulators need to approve the, the, the profit structure and they effectively approve the return on equity. So it's a very stable business because regulators approve um, a decent return on equity, but regulators would never in a million years approve a 52% return on equity. That's the big difference. Um, is one of the big clues there. Um, excellent. Um, any, um, any further thoughts on this or closing thoughts, Glenn, before I wrap? No, I, uh, I think, um, I think we, uh, we got it almost, uh, almost in two hours. <laughs> Yeah, it went a little over, but um, um, uh, I hope you enjoyed this exercise. Uh, when we teach our boot camp, uh, we actually do a 10 company exercise as well. Um, that's a lot harder um, because there's so many moving pieces and so many different companies. And uh, the process of elimination doesn't work quite as well with 10 rather than five. But uh, this is one of my favorite exercises is because it really gets you thinking about, okay, we've just studied a company's financial statements. Um, and this at least pretty much captures two of the major financial statements, the balance sheet and the income statement, um, and uh, sort of forces you to think, okay, what kinds of businesses uh, have what, uh, what do their balance sheets and, uh, and income statements look like? Um, and how does that compare across industries? Um, and uh, so that uh, this, this really, I think, gets you thinking. It's sort of a beautiful ending exercise to uh, what has now been a little over for a four hour session um, on an intro to financial statements. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you wanna take the next level or next leap um, uh, into really applying this to sort of high level investing and trying to be a successful investor and stock picker, um, I'd encourage you to uh, um, take our webinar or our boot camp on lessons from the trenches, uh, Valuing boot camp. Um, if you want to take the next step and ever think about uh, starting your own money management business, uh, um, uh, uh, launch your own hedge fund or that kind of thing. Um, we have a seminar on that teaching this sort of entrepreneurial lessons. Um, and for people who really want to understand short selling, even if they never do it, who just want to understand it better and have that tool in their toolkit, uh, we have a seminar and webinar um, on uh, dedicated uh, specifically to short selling and also um, a conference uh, we do twice a year. The next one's coming up on December 3rd on that. So uh, go to our website at caselearning.com, uh, which has a lot more information, some introductory videos, et cetera, et cetera, on all of this. Um, and if you're interested in any of this, um, you can uh, always shoot me an email if you have any follow-up questions, uh, just at info at caselearning.com. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, uh, we will be sending around uh, these slides um, as well as uh, the video uh, once we post it probably tomorrow. Um, if you want to go back or share it with anyone, um, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we're making this available public and distributing it widely. So so uh, again, thanks for joining us and uh, we're uh, signing off. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, if you'd like to learn more about case learning and our programs, just go to caselearning.com. And if you have any questions, email me at info at caselearning.com. Thank you. <laughs>